up killing it. I think DeFi is a huge puzzle for policymakers, for regulators, but I think it's also a puzzle um, within the industry itself. Not everyone wants to be regulated in the same way. Uh, so we have a really exciting panel here with us uh, from different parts of the sector, different parts of DeFi, different, um, you know, also a lobby group with us. So um, I think this is a great opportunity to get a bit of insights of what it means to regulate DeFi. What do regulators want? What are we even trying to, who are we trying to protect when we want to regulate DeFi? Um, and thank you so much for the introduction and for Brussels Blockchain Week for having all of us. Maybe first of all, it would be a great opportunity since we have a lot of time uh, for this panel to really ask each of you to talk a little bit more about um, the organization that you're working with, your role, and maybe to give the audience a bit of a, something to grasp onto. What is the biggest achievement for your organization in the past year or something that you're proud of? Um, maybe let's start with you, Jeremy. Hello, everybody, and thank you, uh, the Brussels Blockchain Week, for inviting me and having this uh, interesting panel. So just to quick, I'm not the CEO of Morph Labs. I'm the head of legal. Um, I'm an ex-lawyer, and I joined Morph Labs uh, nine months ago. Um, and so Morpho Labs is a company that develops the Morpho protocol. So it's a DeFi lending protocol. And um, I think our biggest achievement is, is, is um, we made Morpho the uh, third largest uh, lending protocol in DeFi worldwide. And uh, now we have more than uh, 700 million uh, of TVL in the protocol. Great, thanks. And for Steen? Hello everyone and thank you for the invitation, really happy to, to be there. So as I was introduced, I'm president of ADAN, which is a professional body. Our main goal is to federate uh, the players that are building Web3 applications, uh, to connect them and to raise their voice with uh, public authority, with regulators, with uh, policy makers. Uh, because as you could notice, there are many things to do. Uh, and especially regarding uh, clarifying the regulatory environment of uh, all those new stakeholders that are building those applications that can be very different. We started with regulating financial use cases using crypto assets, but actually now policymakers are uh, getting interested in uh, much more of the use cases that web technologies uh, allow to develop. Uh, so our goal is to be able to make this environment the most favorable possible for the development of uh, the Web3 industry. So it means for us uh, um, leading, uh, participating into the regulatory debates, but it also means uh, doing lots of education on Web3 because uh, even if we are I think all very familiar with what's happening. That's not the case of uh, the people who are thinking about the laws, thinking about the regulations uh, to, to implement. Um, we are based in France, uh, even if we are uh, gathering the European ecosystem of Web3, but because France started really early in building the regulation of uh, crypto asset markets first, but now thinking about lots of uh, other use cases. And so among the biggest achievements of uh, ADAN this year, uh, the regulatory framework uh, in France is still evolving. And there was a temptation a few months ago to anticipate the implementation of European regulation in France, what would have been very detrimental for the competitiveness of our sector. Uh, so that's something that uh, we could avoid. And uh, instead, uh, we could uh, promote the uh, yeah, elaboration, uh, the uh, strengthening of the registration that is in place in France, while we still have to work on implementing uh, MICA uh, and leading the technical work. And at the EU level, we are uh, in advance of phase regarding the um, framework of DeFi that must be implemented. So we released the report a few weeks ago, giving nine recommendations, nine main recommendations on the regulation of DeFi, so that I do encourage you uh, to read. Uh, and it's very important because right now European institutions are thinking about what could be the framework of DeFi. And uh, the industry must take part of those debates right now if uh, we want it to be uh, the most adapted. Uh, but there are many other um, topics that are being treated uh, in 2023, but I think that we will go back uh, to this uh, later. 
Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Greg. I'm the CEO of Snapshot Labs. So as a whole, our company enables people to vote mostly. Um, everything that relates to DAOs usually goes through us. I would say we have around 90% of market share and 2 million single users on the B2C side and 14K on the B2B side. Uh, we've started as an off-chain product because we believe that democracy is something that should be accessible and affordable. And I think one of the biggest achievements that we'll have this year is releasing finally on-chain products now that Layer 2s enable you to do this at scale. Um, in my case, I do have a legal background, but I'm pretty shit at that. So I'll talk about what I do at the company uh, and also why I strongly believe in legal arbitrage. Um, we were unfortunately in an industry that's kind of like a black sheep amongst quite a lot of industries. And as entrepreneurs, uh, whether in this company or in the companies that I've invested in or created in the past, I do believe that we have a lot of costs and a lot of like headaches already trying to build products and scale them. So if we need to add some at the legal level, well, I'm always going to go for the quick wins. Um, so in our case, for example, we were settling our foundation and establishing everything following the Ethereum Foundation model and consensus working with MME. Um, we absolutely avoided the US and the European Union to settle in Switzerland because we need uh, stability uh, in order to get things done. Hello. Um, hello, my name is Sandy Erkreit. I'm a legal director at Sorella. So Sorella has nothing to do with DeFi, but <laughs> Sorella is, um, is the Web3 sport entertainment platform where you there can acquire uh, digital trading sport cards backed with NFTs and then play those cards into a free-to-play fantasy game. Um, I spent more than 10 years working at Ubisoft, uh, so I have experience in the gaming industry. So my role at Sora is to provide cross-functional legal advice, I would say, about consumer law and protection best practices in a gaming context and with a global scope. Um, Sora has uh, had followed an ambitious growth strategy and uh, despite the market downturn, we succeeded in launching the NBA product, in growing our US-based audience, and we hired more than 80 employees in the United States. And the ultimate goal of Sora is to become mass market and to build a uh, global online uh, sports community where fans, players, and leagues can share a piece of the game they love and interact with real life events. Um, we position ourselves at, as a Web3 company because we, we digitize the Panini cards many of us grew up with, and we back them with NFTs. So success brings scrutiny, I would say. So our main regulatory challenges right now are first qualification of NFTs for sure, and digital assets and associated considerations, and as well gaming and ensuring that we are not qualified as gambling. Um, so I would say that my main project uh, the last year was to convince the regulators that uh, in certain countries that Sora product uh, does not fall within the definition of gambling. Um, because what blockchain brings to the game is the ownership of the in-game assets. And ownership means uh, ability to monetize the in-game assets. But that doesn't mean that the Web3 games are gambling product though, but this is the disruptive innovation of the Web3 games such as Sora, and this is what we need to explain to policymakers and regulators right now. Thank you so much, guys. I think this really shows the diversity in the, in the space. And maybe for our first question, let's start off with answering the question of the panel. How do you regulate DeFi, or at least the part of the space that you're dealing with? Um, how do you regulate without killing innovation? And what would the ideal scenario look like for you? Anyone want to go first? I can. Um, so I think if we want to regulate without killing innovation, we must first understand that Web3 is actually multifaceted. So there are many use cases that are very different. And we started with the MICA regulation that uh, I think everyone is familiar with right now, uh, that is dealing with some kind of use cases, financial use cases of crypto assets. But 
this is not the suitable regulation for all the use cases that can exist in Web3. And it was part of the debates at this time. Should we regulate DeFi under Mika? Should we, should we regulate NFT uh, activities under Mika? Uh, but Europe did the right choice of taking the time on thinking about those very different applications that need uh, their proper regulatory treatment. So in Europe, at least, we started with the right approach. Uh, we uh, defined crypto assets as a new uh, asset class. And then, but it's still a work that we have to do, uh, we are going deeper in the classification of crypto assets. So some uh, activities on some of them will be regulated under Mika, but we still need to uh, define what are NFTs, what are the NFTs that must uh, fall in the scope of Mika, what are the others where uh, a bespoke regime is uh, required, uh, what about stable coins? There, there are still some questions that uh, must be answered. Uh, but the right uh, approach has been taken at the beginning. Uh, we can't regulate Web3 as a whole uh, within Mika. Uh, there is another issue we are a bit more afraid of, is that when um, talking about regulating, for example, DeFi, there is an easy temptation where regulators could fall, is that we do understand, uh, even if we come from traditional finance, for example, uh, we do understand centralized use cases uh, with crypto assets. It's much more dif difficult for policymakers to deal with decentralized applications. And so the easy temptations that they can fall in, and they are actually thinking about it, is to ask for re-centralization of decentralized use cases in order to implement the rules that exist for intermediaries and that uh, would be easy to, to, to ask uh, people to comply with. But it will actually kill innovation because uh, you're asking to distort the use cases, you're, you're asking uh, to re-centralize what was uh, uh, intended to decentralize for all the uh, benefits of decentralization. Uh, so we need to be uh, more uh, imaginative in the regulation for those use cases, but it's very difficult and it's a work that European institutions must do right now. Uh, they are facing decentralized innovation and they can ask for uh, having new intermediaries to reintroduce intermediaries. That would be the easy way to do so. Or uh, we have to think about an innovative way to, to regulate uh, DeFi. And so we have to avoid them to uh, take the first option. Um, otherwise, actually, we will uh, prevent decentralized application to grow in Europe. And actually, they will grow uh, somewhere else. That's, I think, a very good point. Uh, part of what you said is also, it sounds like trying to take oranges and turning them into apples so that they fit into apple regulation. Um, and does anyone else have a, have a thought about how do you regulate the space? So uh, it's a tough question, but I think that I agree with Faustine. I think that regulators need first to, to pause a bit and to take the time to understand uh, the dynamism, the complexity of the innovation at stake because a clear understanding is really key uh, for an efficient regulation, I would say. And uh, I think that the regulators need to take into consideration the actual and the real risk that are associated with the innovation. Um, so for instance, if the regulator's goal is to protect the consumers by uh, fighting addiction, protecting minors, or ensuring transparency of the rules. So I think that they need to have a clear view of what are the risks. And that means cite them, understand them, and take a step back to, to have the best regulations to answer to those risks, I would say. And what would be the best regulations? What would that look like? Or for the field that you are working in? Um, I think it would be a mix of um, let the innovation uh, uh, innovate and pursue its way, uh, invite the actors to comply with existing regulations and to regulate themselves because there are tons of existing regulations that are applicable right now to digital products or services. And I would say transparency uh, understanding and discussions. So let the actors explain what they do and uh, not regulate before that. I see. 
And what about Jeremy or Greg? Well, I think um, um, for me, it's a question of, of finding a, a compromise uh, with the regulator because I think obviously he wants to have some, some sort of, of control and, and, and be able to intervene if, if there's a problem. So as a business, uh, we have to think forward uh, and, and think about what are the compromises that we can find. And the compromises uh, are a mix of, as, as, as Faustine and, and, and Sandy said, uh, is a mix of uh, existing rules um, modified and, and applied. Uh, these, these existing rules, like taking into account uh, the, uh, the innovation in the, in the technology. And so, for example, in the DeFi space, uh, the question is how do we um, how do we accept or do we want to accept uh, systems, decentralized systems, or as Faustin said, uh, do the regulators want to uh, uh, recreate a, f a certain form of centralization, intermediation? And um, that's the key, the key question for DeFi, and um, I, don't know, I don't have the answer for now. Um, my opinion is, is that there will be some, some, some sort of, of intermediation and what we try to push forward uh, as an industry player is to regulate the applications and not the protocols because we think that the protocols have to remain open source because that's what makes the security of um, our systems. Um, so the code must remain free and open source. However, the, what we call the dApps, decentralized applications that give access to these protocols to people who wouldn't be able to um, use the protocol otherwise, uh, we think that uh, it's reasonable for these applications to uh, uh, su support uh, certain obligations and, and standards. Because, and the reason for that is that there's a, an asymmetry of information uh, and skill between the one who provides the application and the user who uses the application. So it makes sense to have some, some obligations there. So the key concept for us that we try to push with the regulators, and most recently with the French Banking Authority, is to regulate applications and not protocols. And Greg? I mean, in my case, I would take a step back, and it's a question we can answer for any innovative industry. It's about having holistic processes and doing good stakeholder management. Like, we need to be able to listen to everyone and also understanding what the perspective is. Because in our industry, we have also a big problem that we have very diverging opinions based on which actor is talking. And we also need to understand that the regulator needs to put the budget to understand it and to be able to catch up with the pace of innovation. Right now, when we look at what has been done, it feels like quite a few things have been rushed all around the world. And if you want to follow the pace of innovation, you need to give yourself the means to do that. Uh, that's why in our industry, we have like lobbying agencies like Yedan who are trying to represent us to, to a large extent. But at the governmental side, like, it feels like they're trying to work with sticks and stones to understand, like, to, to, to kill like, uh, the machine that we became. And it is scary indeed, because, I mean, looking at both companies here, 700 millions of nearly assets under management in, what, two years? A multi-billion dollar company in four years? It is scary, and it's understandable. But uh, you really cannot do anything if you don't put the means to it. Well, you're, you're right. There is a clear problem of resources and expertise uh, without public uh, authority. That's why we usually we end that panel about talking about regulation. But less usually, and it's actually very important, we have to speak about supervision too. Uh, we have to regulate. We have to authorize uh, actor, and we have. Uh, we need resources, we need staff, we need expertise to understand how you can, uh, w what is the cybersecurity uh, uh, provisions that the CASPER must implement, for example. So there is a need at this level. But then if you want uh, your regulation to be efficient and to be followed, you have to be a regulator and a supervisor. And on this uh, specific topic in France, as we can uh, have the experiment, uh, we see that there is a clear lack uh, of um, enforcement and sanctions against those who did not comply with the regulation that we implemented. And we are a bit afraid that uh, at the EU level, when MICA will be uh, implemented, will enter it to application, uh, we still have uh, those problems of resources. And at the end, actually, you're penalizing the people that follow the rules. 
uh, and that uh, wish to be serious and credible by following uh, the rules that uh, we implemented. And at the end, after, uh, you're penalizing the clients, the customers, because uh, the most competitive actors will be the ones who don't follow regulations, who did not uh, implement the cost of following regulations, so they are more competitive, uh, they are more attractive, but they are also uh, giving less protection to, to clients. So the, the question of resources is uh, crucial uh, at the level of regulation, but even more at the legal level of supervision. I think that's a very interesting point because um, we see, like for example, with Mika, with a regulation that's about to roll out here in Europe, we see regulators and like, in, for example, the Banking Authority, the Markets and Securities Authority, building up their capacity to slowly take on these supervising roles. But for now, if you know, from one day to the next, suddenly there's supervision, there's definitely a lack of resources. Um, and that hopefully is an issue that can be avoided. Um, I think we touched upon uh, what your main message is to regulators. And if you're ha maybe if you have, uh, we can do a little quick round of, if you, your main message to regulators, if you're having these conversations, what is the number one takeaway that they, that your, what is your number one takeaway for them? I'll just, I'm going to say it again, but for, for us it's, it's to regulate applications and not protocols. And I think also another point is the in DeFi, the distinction between the products and services, and this is the key concept of regulating the applications and not the protocols. Um, and the other question is, um, relates to the DAOs uh, and the way we organize ourselves. And, um, and this is a complete different question from the products and service question. It, it's more a question of uh, national state law than a question of EU law. And on this question, uh, um, it's the question of how do you recognize a DAO in a legal system. And uh, our message uh, in this regard is for the state to have some flexibility and uh, uh, to not sanction the um, organization that we have created, for example, at Morpho, uh, so we have Morpho Labs, which is the uh, development company, and we have a, an association, a French association, that uh, role is to uh, promote uh, the development of the Morpho protocol. And so um, we would like the regulators and the state to recognize this organization and not necessarily force us into a specific scheme, because this uh, scheme of having a non-profit organization and some development companies is an industry standard. As I'm sure you know, Ethereum is organized uh, this way with the Ethereum Foundation in Switzerland. Tezos, also with a sponsor, is organized this way. So uh, on this question, we would like the regulators to recognize this uh, organization with the non-profit and the development companies. So uh, at Sorare, we think it's it's natural for for nascent technology to open up dialogue for uh, with regulators, and we we uh, we engage proactively and openly with them. So yes, we have conversations with policymakers and regulators right now, um, but proactively we try, <laughs> and um, I think that. Our main message is that first we try to create alliances because I think it's really important and that stronger, we, are, we are stronger together and we are more able to convince them that uh, there is no point of killing what, is, uh, what we create and that to convince them that uh, there are opportunity to size here with creation of jobs, with uh, creation of wealth uh, so really, together we are stronger. And then I think that our, um, our main message with the, with the regulators is really to explain the technology, to educate them on the nuances of our product, which we strongly believe it's not a gambling product. And then we explain what are the differences between a, a money game and what we offer, and, um, and explaining. This is really the main message we have with the regulators right now. And the associated risk, of course. Um, I think the regulators, the policy makers, 
have to be clear on the definition of the scopes of uh, the rules that they want to implement. I mean, uh, we still need to define what is uh, DeFi, what are decentralized applications. We need to define what is Web3 Gaming. If uh, France uh, wishes to implement a regime uh, uh, before the EU, uh, we have to define what is a stable coin that fall in Mika and does not fall in Mika. And we have to keep flexible with definitions because Web3 use cases are evolving, evolving technological challenges must still to be solved. And uh, we will see in the coming years uh, applications that uh, at this stage, we, if we don't anticipate, uh, we could uh, prevent them from uh, developing with too strict uh, frameworks and definitions. But so at the very beginning, uh, there is still a need uh, to, to clarify the scope, the definitions uh, of uh, what uh, regulators want to regulate, um, to be sure that what they are thinking about in terms of uh, rules and obligations uh, are relevant uh, for those uh, use cases. Um, the, maybe we started with thinking about uh, regulation of technological assets, but regulation is about applications and not technologies, as, uh, as you said, and that's why uh, Fortunately, we could avoid mistakes, uh, but there were uh, thing, um, work uh, on regulating NFTs. Actually, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to regulate NFT. You regulate kind of NFT activities, uh, but they can be also very different from uh, each other. So. Um, it's understandable that the growing of this innovation raise uh, concerns for regulators uh, that they want to set rules. Uh, but they have to be sure first of what they are regulating. I think that's a really good point and also links with what Sandy was saying about education. And when you're educated about the topic, you, you know, naturally you'll be able to define the scopes in these regulations. And Greg? Start hiring technically competent people. If I have to explain to you what a computer is and how it works, I'm going to have a bad time explaining to you what I do for a living. To the point, indeed. Um, in a moment, I'll ask you guys about what policies you think everyone should know about uh, that are you know, coming up for the space. But first, I want to turn our attention to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, because we had some big news in the past few days with the US Securities and Exchange Commission um, filing lawsuits against Binance and then Coinbase within you know, two days. So this is a big you know, situation for the crypto industry, maybe less of a focus here in Europe, where you know, there's already this regulatory pathway. Uh, you know, the, <coughs> head of policy of Uniswap who just spoke here said he was very jealous of our you know, situation here with regulation. So um, regarding this, what do you think this kind of news, of course, it's not the first lawsuits. We're, we're you know, in a long history. We're not even surprised anymore, but it's still um, you know, a, a theme that's ongoing in the US. What does it mean for DeFi and what does it mean um, for your organizations? Oh, um, I think it's... Um um, it's very political and not so much legal or anything else. Um, it's uh, obviously it's uh, Gary Gensler and the SEC who clearly has an agenda against crypto. Um, so I think it's uh, it won't have much repercussions. I think uh, they'll get fined probably, which is unfortunate um, if they settle or uh, or they go to trial. Um, I think the other news is also the uh, crypto bill uh, that was uh, published uh, Friday by the chair of uh, the Agricultural and Financial Committee in the House. Um, and this bill addresses the question of what is a digital asset. So it counters all the um, position of, of the SEC. Uh, it also defines what are uh, decentralized networks. So interesting topics that we have an address uh, in uh, in Europe, for example, and uh, this links to the question of this uh, of this debate of this session. I think that uh, how do you rela regulate uh, innovation? The question that you have to ask is, what is the the goal, the political goals behind? What are the interests of a certain country towards this um, technology? And I think, obviously, that there's a big difference between uh, the situation of the United States and Europe. I think that France has, has seen an interest in this technology. That's why it, it was one of the first countries to have a, a comprehensive uh, 
uh, regulatory regime and, and the European Union is following. So I think that the nation states in Europe are, are seeing an interest in this technology for sovereignty to get away from the dollar a bit, I don't know. Um, whereas in the US, it, it's not currently the case under the current uh, government. So part of the question also with regulation is uh, the political uh, goals behind. And um, yeah, and, and, and for us as citizens, the question is, how, what do we want to do with this technology? And I think that if we want to use it, uh, in the end, you know, democracy will, will provide a, um, a, 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 you know, a regime uh, satisfactory. Um, so yeah, on the US, I think it's just Gary Gensler launching its last battle on crypto. Um, he got destroyed in Congress two weeks ago, so three or four weeks before, so he's probably going to be gone um, when at the next year presidential election, and uh, the House is controlled by Republicans, and they pro-crypto, so um, yeah, I think the crypto bill, the McHenry Thompson bill, is, is the one to follow here. And um, do you think, does it impact you personally? No, because we, for now, uh, for example, at, uh, for the front end, for, for, so for the DAP that we developed for, to access the Morpho protocol, uh, we exclude, uh, in our terms, uh, US citizens. Uh, I mean, they could still use them, but we don't enforce anything, but uh, we say that we don't serve US citizens. Um, so, because of the uh, uncertainty, the legal uncertainty, so, um, you know, these suits doesn't uh, help with that, uh, but the, I think the crypto, bill, the crypto bill will help. And um, as I said, in the crypto bill, there's a definition of decentralized networks. For example, there's the notion that uh, one entity, one person should not hold more than 20% of the voting, route, voting rights. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And, um, and yeah, they also give a definition of decentralized networks, and they say that if, you're, if you only manage like the code and the development of the code and you do not provide the service as the DAO, uh, you don't have to register uh, to the SEC or the CFTC. So uh, it's, it's quite in line in the end with uh, the exclusion of uh, DeFi from Mika uh, on the idea that if it's sufficiently, sufficiently decentralized, then for now you're not, you're not regulated. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Um, I'm curious, Sandy, you know, because you're dealing with NFTs and often those are excluded from regulations. So what's your relationship with, with all these different, uh, you know, regulations and policies when it comes to NFTs? We are, we are not impacted by what the SEC decided to do yesterday and the day before. Um, so we are not directly impacted and uh, I would like to say yet. Uh, and because I think it's not a good signal here that has been sent to the to the Web3 industry. And um, I think that the, the, the really bad signal is that the path that they took is the enforcement. And this is uh, the contrary of what we recommend to do about collaboration, transparency, nuanced approach, because they really took the path of the enforcement. So we are not directly impacted, but it's not a good signal, and we're going to work on it. <laughs> keep the NFTs uh, excluded, which is the case of the digital bill that Jeremy mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good bill to keep an eye out for. Um, and to follow along from that, what are the policies that you think people in the audience should keep an eye out, people who are in the industry? What are the names of the bills and what they do? Uh, what kind of uh, tips do you have for people here? So uh, at the EU level, we all think that uh, Mika is over, but actually not at all. Uh, there is lots of technical work to be done, because uh, a new regulation is made of uh, several texts. Mika that uh, we adopted a few days ago is the level one uh, regulation. But then we are waiting for technical clarifications, let's say level two and level three texts, uh, to be prepared by regulators in order to help actors understand how to comply with Mika and to help supervisors uh, to, to authorize uh, um, the actors. So for example, uh, in Mika, we know that CASP will need an issuer of crypto assets. We need to comply with environmental uh, obligations. So that's in the level one uh, Mika that we have. But 
we don't know what those obligations are uh, in uh, in detail. So this is a work of those technical uh, texts that uh, regulators are preparing right now, and they will need to consult the industry. Uh, some consultation will start uh, before summer, and uh, we'll go over the rest of the year. And so we are deeply involved uh, in this uh, in this technical work that is very important uh, for the preparation of uh, actors and the good implementation of MICA. Uh, in June, there is another piece of regulation that is uh, key for the um, markets in crypto assets, which is the uh, IMLR, the Anti-Money Laundering Regulation. Uh, Sweden, which is uh, at the head of the presidency of the EU Council right now, really wish uh, to find uh, a political uh, deal by the end of the month on this uh, regulation. And there are many threats uh, for crypto asset markets. Uh, and actually, lots of actors mean CASP, DeFi applications, and NFT platforms, uh, which could be uh, in the scope of this uh, regulation. So it's uh, the final line. Uh, before this political deal uh, where we have the uh, opportunity uh, to push our position. And at the French level, but this will be key uh, for the work to be done in the EU, uh, France really want to uh, um, uh, create a legislation for Web3 Gaming, what we call Jonum in France, um, and uh, has started to consult the industry uh, to define what could be uh, the, game, the Web3 Gaming to be uh, to be addressed by this new regime, uh, and I, w I was saying that it will be important for Europe because we know that Europe we need to uh, think about a bespoke regime for NFT activities, and with this uh, Jonum initiative in France, that's the first uh, step uh, in the uh, in the EU, uh, where a country wishes to. Uh, legiferate um, on uh, on NFT use cases, so we know that it will help in the discussions and the debates at the EU level, and so that's why we have to be ready at the French level, then the European level, uh, on this uh, specific topic. Thank you so much, Christine. That's really really helpful. Also for me as a journalist, always keeping an eye out. Um, so, so Rea is actively working with all the other Web3 gaming actors to the Jonum bill, which um, Faustine mentioned. Uh, I think this is key for all the, the, gaming, the Web3 gaming sector and the industry. Um, so the French government shared uh, its plans to introduce uh, a bill and a new framework that will uh, allow the Web3 games to operate without being qualified or without uh, knowing the risk of being qualified as gambling. Uh, so this is really key and, uh, and we are really happy with that because I think it's really, as you said, taking into consideration the use case of the NFTs and creating a bespoke, uh, a tailor-made framework uh, that take into consideration the innovation. So because, what, like I said, blockchain brings ownership and when you own an in-game asset you can trade exchange sell it but that doesn't make you a gambling product as well so the 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 real work of education that all the web3 gaming actors needs to do right now is to explain the the major and the fundamental differences between us the the web3 games and the money games um, and we need as well to take into consideration as jeremy mentioned the political goal behind, because there are always a political agenda. And what is the timeline on this bill? Good question. Um, so the, the actors are being consulted right now, so that means Web3 gaming actors, video, game, video games, and uh, gambling operators as well. Um, and the, the Jonium framework is part of the Bill that transpose, oh, sorry, <laughs> that transpose the DSA and DMA, uh, DMA in uh, into French law. So the agenda is quite short, and I think that it will be before the Senate in July. Okay, good to know. Um, and Greg, is there any policies that you're following, or is that out um, of? I mean, in the European Union, no. But uh, when you look at what's happening in Hong Kong and Dubai at the moment, you can actually see that. Uh, as it's a political game more than anything else, uh, you need to look for alternatives or look for places that did not evolve like what we did with Switzerland. 
I hope that the European Union can, well, you know, get itself together and do something like as good as what the French ecosystem did, because so far they're probably the only European country that managed to do things right. I'm actually on the francophone, um, you know, panel <laughs> here, um, so maybe it's interesting to get an extra question to just give perspective of where France is compared to the European Union, and has France really been this trailblazer? Because I know before Mika, France was already busy. Um, with you know, working on crypto asset regime. Um, and did that actually influence Mika? And now with this new bill, is France actively trying to be the front runner of Europe? I think so, and I hope. <laughs> and I hope, uh, I think it's the, the, the evidence that France is supporting its own tech champions at first. And then I think that if the, the Genome framework is a success, I hope that it will inspire other countries to adapt their existing framework to the Web3 sector. And I, I think that France has yeah, seen a strategic interest in investing in, into crypto, so we are lucky for that. But this can change also, so we must not forget if we get a different government. Um, so yeah, part of the game is, is playing the political game, working with politicians and uh, becoming politicians or doing some lobbying uh, as Coinbase is doing currently for example and um, and yeah I think it's uh, I think it'll be you know in France for now we're lucky in the European it's a bit more complicated with certain parties who have a big influence there so I think as a whole as an ecosystem if we want to have some rules that we want to be able to define uh, we have to to place some some pawns here uh, in the in the political system so, uh, yeah, in France, actually, we uh, implemented the first steps of the EU regulations. Uh, first, Mika, but actually the others that are coming uh, will be influenced by the precursor work of France. So Mika is uh, directly inspired from the uh, CASP regime that was uh, established in France in uh, 2019, so uh, more than uh, four years uh, right now. Uh, we had a consultation led by the French banking supervisor a few weeks ago on DeFi, which uh, this, uh, uh, this is called ICPR, released one of the first uh, major reports on DeFi and its regulation. And so it uh, was consulting the industry in order to understand if the, um, the ideas that they have were good enough. Uh, and this will be uh, a major piece of work during the EU debates on the definition of uh, DeFi. The Genou regime will obviously uh, be on the table when uh, defining what are NFT use cases that will not fall in Mika and that we need uh, proper regulation. Uh, and so I think that uh, this um, work uh, explain why lots of big players uh, actually looks uh, at uh, look at France when it comes to set their EU headquarters uh, because what does it mean? It means that we can have legal certainty and uh, it can help prepare uh, in the perspective of the harmonization of uh, EU regulation. It means that our authorities are kind of experts and uh, knowledgeable about uh, Web3 and crypto assets. Uh, it means that there is a, an ecosystem that is uh, also very dynamic with a lot of uh, talents uh, that, uh, uh, that are um, uh, really famous uh, abroad. Uh, and so we do need to encourage, uh, but as Jeremy said, it can change. We do need to encourage this still in order to make uh, Europe the center of the international Web3 hub. Uh, but there is still lots of work to do. Uh, it means attractiveness of the EU, but it also means, and I think it's where we are maybe uh, uh, less, um, less good uh, in, on this uh, side, the development of our own uh, organic uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, I think uh, there is a bigger focus on competitiveness, on attractiveness, sorry, than uh, competitiveness. I mean, at the same time, we also have to thank uh, industry champions who have been pushing things for the right reasons, and also people who have been working in these institutions uh, who have been internal champions for our industry, and one of them is actually sitting there. It's uh, Yvan from the BPI. Like, he's one of the guys who have been helping the whole French ecosystem, and we don't have that in many countries, so we also 
need to remember that it's through the sheer power of individuals who wanted to move things forward for the right reasons that we're getting somewhere. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> Shout out. Um, so, yeah, very interesting to hear about the role of France and, you know, how this ties into the communication between regulators and the industry. Um, maybe to circle back to earlier in our conversation, from my understanding, we want, we, the industry wants the regulators to, um, you know, be more educated and understand the difference, the different definitions, the different applications, and so on. Um, but for regulators to create bespoke regimes is a lot of work. A lot of time, they'll prefer to just you know, throw something into the same bucket or maybe add a few lines here and there. Is there any time where augmenting existing laws works for DeFi or for crypto? Is, some, is, is there any situation where maybe that's fine? Like, I, I think like the question, like I think it was like, a, I don't know, a ministry of the United Kingdom or something like that that said, blockchain can force us to rewrite 400 years of law. So um, I think it's a bit uh, complicated and uh, to rewrite everything from scratch. So I think the best approach is to adapt what, what exists and try to create new things. Just, just two comments on, on, the, you know, on the current regu uh, regulations. The definition of dif digital assets is not clear at all. It what go it's what gover governs the application of Mika, for example. But it's very complicated. What is a digital asset? Is a is a gov is a governance token and a DAO? Is is it really like only a, a utility token, or is it cl something closer to uh, security? Um, so that's a very complicated question, and it's not at all resolved uh, currently under the text. I think for that we have to have a pragmatic approach and say, okay, if we are in the blockchain ecosystem, in DAOs, etc., it's a digital asset, and we apply digital asset rules, but there can be some, some conflict here. And the second point, um, to, to, to go further on what was saying uh, Grégoire, is um, it's tempting for uh, some states to push regulations for various political agendas, control the market, etc., and protect consumers. Um, okay, that's, uh, we can agree with that as players in, in the game. But uh, yeah, we must not rush it because some subjects can be forgotten. For example, uh, in France, the tax subject is completely forgotten. How do we tax digital assets? How do we tax an ICO as a company? Uh, currently, um, you have to pay a, a corporate tax and VAT on the sale of tokens, which makes it uh, really um, impossible. So there are ways around this, but it's not perfect. and. Uh, and that explains, for example, in France, we have an ICO regime, which is good. In, in, under Mika, we'll have one also. But if we don't address the tax question, these regimes won't be used, and, we'll, and the people will still use uh, companies offshore, et cetera, which is not the goal of, of the legislation. So we have to push uh, through our lobbying efforts, uh, regulators, and, and, and to tell them that, OK, we have this now, but we need to address also other questions, and one of them is, is taxation. Thanks, and we also have just one or two minutes left. So is there any final remarks um, that maybe respond to this question or just something for the audience to take away? Just, just to answer your, your, your last question, I think that this is not because there is a new technology or an innovation that we need to raise everything that already exists. Uh, on the contrary, we need to look at uh, what, what, what are the current and existing regulations, because I do think that consumer blockchain products are already regulated by strong um, protections uh, in, in the EU with the GDPR, with the consumer protection law, the uh, digital content directive. There is a lot of, of, of existing regulations that already capture the consumer blockchain products. And I would add as well that um, if you want to keep and gain your consumer's trust, which I think it's a key to serve your ambitions, or at least for sorority is key, I think. And so that means that you need to put in place everything that you, you can to, to protect this trust. And that means being compliant with all the regulations, give clear, transparent information, and allow them to control their experience. 
No, I'm good, I think. <laughs> uh, so maybe to, for, for the end, uh, what is necessary is to make regulation being enforced. We, um, we are imagining lots of rules. Uh, there are some that already exist and that uh, should, uh, where actors should fall in, and that's the first step. Uh, we have to pay attention of uh, those actors who do not uh, respect the rules that exist today. And after, we will be able uh, to see what are the regulations that we do need. Uh, but well, that, that's the main message that I would have at the end. Never forget supervision when uh, you're thinking about regulations, so make it pragmatic and efficient. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It was really great to hear these insights from you guys. Um, I'm always writing about these topics for DL News, so I'm uh, you know, fascinated and inspired from this conversation um, and hope to follow up with all of you. Uh, Thank thanks you. Thanks for listening. Cheers.